thank you, Senator Collins, and thank you, Senator Alexander and Senator Murray, for calling this hearing and for asking us to preside here. Um, I am very much looking forward to this. You know, this hearing is part of an ongoing series on health information technology. We've previously discussed the views of doctors, of hospitals, and of electronic health uh, record vendors. Today we're going to talk about how health IT can work for patients. Patients want access to their own health data and they should have an easy way to do that. Making sure that patients have access to their own information is also the best way to engage patients in their own health care and to improve outcomes. Now, we've come a long way from the time when doctors wrote all of their notes in paper charts and then filed them away until the next visit. But we still have a way to go before we have the kind of interoperable, consumer-friendly system that will make sure that patients can actually see their own information and that will give access to that information to different doctors, hospitals, and other health care providers. In 1996, when Congress passed the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, it set important privacy standards and it made clear that patients have a right to see their own medical records and a right to send their medical records to other physicians. In 2009, Congress expanded those rights with the High Tech Act, encouraging hospitals and doctors to set up electronic health record systems. And today, after a federal investment of more than $30 billion, most medical records are digital. But there is a huge problem these systems still don't talk to each other very well. That means that too many patients who try to access their records or who try to transfer from one doctor to another can't do so electronically. This lack of interoperability imposes other costs, wasted medical tests, wasted time, and wasted money. A 2014 study from the University of Michigan found that emergency rooms that shared electronic health records through a regional information exchange ordered fewer duplicate medical tests. Patients in these ERs were 59% less likely to have a redundant CT scan, 44% less likely to get a duplicate ultrasound, and 67% less likely to have a duplicated chest x-ray than patients who visited unconnected hospitals. That's better care at lower costs. We know that interoperability works. Individual health plans, hospitals, regional networks, and even big private companies like Intel have done it. The federal electronic health records programs have taken us part of the way toward making sure that all patients and providers around the country have access to an interoperable system. But there's more work to be done, and here's what I think we still need to do. We need a standard format for recording and sending test results and other medical information. We need a way to accurately identify which records belong to which patient. And we need incentives to encourage doctors and electronic health vendors to share information. The federal government has invested billions of dollars in health information. It is now time to implement policies that create a system that works across the board. I appreciate our witnesses being here today, and I'm looking forward to a discussion about how we can make sure that health information systems are efficient and that they work for patients. The federal government has spent more than $30 billion supporting the adoption of electronic health records. And we did it because we know that exchanging health information and providing patients with access to their data can reduce health care costs and can improve patient outcomes, as you've just been talking about. And we've come a long way. But today, many providers still can't exchange information. And as Ms. Giusti and Mr. Dishman have just testified, many patients still can't easily access their information. So, Mr. Dishman, I'd like to ask you about Intel's health insurance plan for its employees. Mm. I understand that in some areas it provides highly coordinated care. And as part of the coordination, Intel requires that any provider that's part of the Intel plan must be able to exchange patient health information, including tests or diagnoses, with any other doctor in the system. 
Can you say something about how that requirement has affected the health of your employees generally? Sure. Well, it, it for one thing, it started to produce the results that we wanted. I mean, just in the first year in New Mexico where we rolled out this connected care program, um, you know, as we aimed for the triple aim, the costs were held about the same, but we significantly improved outcomes in things like uh, management of diabetes and the reduction of cost of diabetes. So uh, same cost but much better outcomes. Same, same cost, but much better outcomes. Um, and, you know, we had to write into our RFPs of both the providers and their vendors saying, we're going to hold you accountable not only for showing that you are saying that you are a standards-based EHR, but vigorously testing against it to actually prove it. And they did not get full payment unless they could actually show that they did this. We're a very engineering culture at Intel, so it's not surprising. I mean, it was, you know, you might think, oh, were our, were our employees sur surprised? And it was like, no, they expected it. They said, we're a data-driven you know, bunch of engineers who are expecting to have this information to them. The big surprise in the study so far, and as we've rolled out this out in Oregon and now New Mexico and California next, has been the clinicians. The clinicians across these multiple providers, multiple insurance companies, different versions of EPIC implementations of their EHR, some of them using a different EHR with Greenway, were like, oh my gosh. Now that I've tasted interoperability, I can do what I'm supposed to do with my Hippocratic Oath, deliver high quality care to my patients. Okay, so you've given us some idea of what we can get with interoperability. Let me ask you more about it. As part of Medicare Access and the CHIP Reauthorization Act that was signed into law earlier this year, Congress set a national objective of achieving widespread interoperability by the end of 2018. The Department of Health and Human Services has recently proposed rules for the final stage of the Electronic Health Record Meaningful Use Program. Mr. Dishman, I want to ask if you think that the proposed rule alone will ensure that health records can be easily exchanged and that patients in this country will have the same benefits that the employees at Intel have. Well, first I would say I know there's lots of pressure for folks who want to delay. Don't delay. This is a hard transformation. Keep it going in 2017 and 2018. But we're not done with meaningful use by that stage. We may call it something different out in time, but the fact of the matter is if we want a complete medical record, what's currently in the EHR today, the clinical data, doesn't include the claims data, doesn't include the imaging data, doesn't include the genomic data that's coming, and doesn't include the consumer health data. We need to get out and establish standards for these new data types ahead common, of them. Common you know, standards. Problems. Common uh -huh. common data models, common standards. Test and validate to make sure that those standards are actually being implemented. And you know, be ready to sort of understand that a complete medical record that I need to save my life with cancer or that uh, Kathy's folks do with multiple myeloma is not just what's in the traditional EHR. And we're going to have to keep driving towards that innovation model. And it's probably going to take us four or five more years to really get there. All right. Well, thank you. You know, I, I, I just want to underline what I'm hearing you say on this, that even though the Meaningful Use Program has had a lot of success in driving doctors and hospitals to adopt electronic health records, the final stage, as proposed, does not guarantee interoperability or true patient engagement. And this is really frustrating because the technology to create patient-centric interoperable health care system exists, as you are proving, and Intel and others have demonstrated that it can work. As the committee continues to look into this issue, I hope that we can find ways to build on the Meaningful Use Program to break down the remaining barriers to interoperability. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I want to ask about medical research. We all know mm -hmm. about the importance of medical research and how now, the digitization of health information just opens up tremendous potential for facilitating clinical research. Ms. Justy, some of your testimony about this is, is truly amazing. Um, now, you have made the point that many patients and their families want to participate. Mm -hmm. They want to be part of this. And so when we talk about what serves patients, we talk about what serves them one at a time to track their own numbers, but we talk about it in terms of medical research and how the aggregated information is far more valuable for, for creating uh, new research opportunities. So I want to ask two quick questions about this. I want to start, Mr. Dishman, if I can, with you. Could you just identify some of the barriers that researchers face when they conduct clinical research using self-reported patient data? 
It's the wrong button there. Um, well, let's take cancer for an example. So first of all, you have to understand that there's so little data out there for people to do cancer research. Fewer than 1% 1 1 of cancer patients have actually had a whole genome sequence. If you go look at the data that researchers have access to in something like cancer, 4% of the data that's out there is sitting in the public data sets where the data has been curated so that they can actually make meaningful research out of it. The other 96% is sitting in the private data centers of the hospitals, cleansers, and cancer clinical centers and cancer centers that are out there. The ability to tap into what's below the iceberg and do research on that is the key. And the only way that that's going to be facilitated is through secure sharing. Once you have the secure sharing infrastructure, you can start to combine self-report data, consumer-generated data from things like wearables, omic data, and clinical data. And it is the triangulation of those data sets against one another where the truth may lie. And, and I think a lot of the resistance for researchers, and sometimes in using the self-report data, is they just don't have enough of the data sets to triangulate all of these pieces. Uh, one of the things that's starting to happen is, let's create a stream where patients themselves can contextualize their clinical data. Not change it in the record, uh, but actually put a stream next to it that says, hey, you know, I don't really have asthma. It was a response to a chemo side effect that I was on for three months, but now everybody believes I have asthma, right? That kind of data could both help both the future clinicians looking back at it, but also can help the researchers make sense of the self-report data against the stream of, of clinical data. That okay, so I get your point about repository, and I get your point about multiple data sets, but if I just ask you one more, the role of standards yes. in reporting, can you just say a word about that? Yeah, I mean, it's it's this is back to standards standards at all levels and security at all levels. Um, the, uh, there are many known self-report measures now that have been clinically proven if they're executed in the standard way to be reliable self-report measures. So the notion that you can't you know, make clinical outcomes or research outcomes out of, out of self-report is just, it's, it's just not true. Good. And so maybe I can follow up then with Ms. Giusti and you can talk just a little bit about how the foundation mm -hmm. has overcome many of the barriers uh, to doing uh, research in multiple myeloma. Right. So um, you could tell that I was very focused on a, a trial we were calling COMPASS, where we sequenced mm -hmm. a thousand myeloma patients and built our own data bank. The barriers that we had to overcome in COMPASS itself were we needed all the academic centers to share, otherwise we'd never build a critical mass of data. Every center sees some myeloma patients, but not enough to get that critical mass. And by the way, myeloma is not alone. Most diseases are breaking down into smaller and smaller types of diseases. The second was we had to allow everybody to give up intellectual property so that they would be able to share all this data. And then the third was the importance of maintaining all the patients in getting the longitudinal data. So we have to keep them in this data set over time. And the way you do that is by sharing the data with them and aggregating the data and telling them what they're learning from it. But importantly for EHRs is one of the most expensive pieces of this was developing the protocol, but also the case report forms by which to study the COMPASS trial over an extended number of years, and the money it cost to do the trial, which was $40 million for a small nonprofit like ours to raise. Looking forward, if you had good standards and if we could integrate all of this information, you could, number one, use EHRs to start to identify, especially if you have genomics, what's going on in these diseases. But secondly, think about this. If you're a patient that goes on and knows your genomics, when the trial opens, you can raise your hand. And like I mentioned to you before, Finding patients for clinical trials and accruing trials quickly is the number one obstacle mm -hmm. in drug development. So, you know, if you can do this wisely, not only do you improve outcomes and improve drug development, but you build in so much efficiency. And that's why it's so important. So thank you both so much. Thank, thank our entire panel. You know, researchers are on the cusp of so many great discoveries, and we need to make sure they're not slowed down by data systems that are just working in silos, that are not sharing the information. The work done by the Multiple Myeloma Research Foundation, by Intel, by other partners, working to overcome these data barriers and their success in using patient data, I think, really show us the future. And I hope that as this committee continues to focus on health information, that we're going to make sure that we're building uh, a, a, an approach to data that will support a 21st century research enterprise. Thank you all so much, and thank you, Madam Chair.